Today we're going to talk about uh, MHD more. So I'm going to go. So last time I went through, uh, I derived the MHD equations, which we'll put up. Um, I'm going to put up again, and I'm just going to talk about those equations for a little while um, because there's a lot of meat that we can that we can get, and a lot of cool understanding, a lot of physics that we can learn just by looking at the structures of the equation. Um, then I'm going to talk about statics and the sausage instability, which is one of my favorite instability names. I'm not, if there's something satisfying about sausage instability. Um, and if we get to waves, then I went way too fast past the first two bits and nobody understood anything, but that might happen. I probably will not get to waves today. Um, oh, uh, who doesn't have their midterm? Oh, now everything's back. I think everybody did pretty good. Um, oh, did I forgot to rate your total on the top? Sorry about that. No. Uh, hopefully that'll be in Canvas eventually, once I enter those grades. Um, uh, okay, so there's a reading to today, and uh, several of you had some great questions. Uh, so I'm, I got a list of the questions. I'm going to kind of jot through them real fast. Uh, because some of them are, please explain Alfane's theorem a little better. So I'll do that. So I have, please explain better Alfane's theorem, the Bennett pinch, the waves, sunspots, magnetized winds, uh, Chandra Sekar's Q and Ferraro's law. All of these I'm going to do again. And so please, if you have more questions after I go through it, uh, ask, ask those questions then. Um, uh, let's see. So several of you had questions that were just, please go over. Uh, this I didn't get it from the book so which I appreciate because that's kind of reminds me where I need to spend time um, I already understand everything already because I've been through it like a lot um, uh, some other questions that we had um, uh, s several of you are confused by the bit where he says we have isotropy when the collision frequency is larger than the cyclotron frequency because that's kind of a strange sentence so one of the one of the things that plagues plasma physics is we want like all of our um, all of our statistical mechanics really assumes that things are pretty random and there's not like preferred anything so pretty random generally we assume to be is isotropic that means there's not a preferred direction but i have a magnetic field oh can i Magnetic fields are blue. Is there a blue one? Magnetic fields are blue. Um, and if I had colored chalk, I, for a second I would say it's because I had colored chalk and I can color code my lecture properly. Anyway, uh, squirrel brain to the rescue. Okay, so I have this magnetic field, and the magnetic field is inherently a vector, and it's got a direction. So when I've got some magnetic field, say I've got some plasma, like a uh, <coughs> Like one of those, have you ever seen those plasma balls that are like glass things and they got that pink stuff in them? That's a plasma, it's a really low rent plasma. It's just argon. And argon's awesome because A, it doesn't do anything, and B, it's got all these loosely bound electrons, so they're really easy to flick electrons off of it. Um, uh, but there's always some little local, if I zoom in locally enough, there's always a little magnetic field. Uh, and that magnetic field has some direction. And that's a pain in the butt because now I have a direction. Now I have a preferred direction along the magnetic field. Um, but if things are spinning around, so the cyclotron frequency, let's, let me put up these length scales again. The Debye length is the streaming length. Uh, oh, and actually, I want to hook up um, where you can find these. Uh, so this is on page 220, in case you want to go read this derivation. 
Uh, the cyclotron frequency. This is electrons around magnetic fields. So when we've got an electron circulating around a magnetic field, that operates the cyclotron frequency. That's on page 198. And the plasma frequency is electrons cycling around electric fields. And that's, okay, his, the derivation in the book is on page 240. My derivation, I Googled, and I got a better derivation that I like more. Um, I, I, if I think about it and I remember, I'll try to type it up and put it online because that derivation is nicer. It's shorter, it's less heinous, it's less heavy, it doesn't invoke as many machi machines. All you need to do is say, I've got a uniform field of electrons. I push them a little bit, it makes an electric field, that's going to oscillate like an oscillator and that's going to oscillate with this frequency with the plasma frequency the book's derivation is like he he gets this thing that's one minus omega p squared over omega squared and he says this is that's his derivation of the plasma frequency which is okay but it's not satisfying it doesn't really get you the intuition so i'll try to fix that up uh and the last one oh and the resistivity find that on page 265. So there's three chapters worth of stuff that, that I'm skipping and it's all interesting and it's all worth your time to read especially if you have interest in plasma physics. So the idea is we want to turn this we want to turn this process where we've got a vector field even locally we've got a vector field and we've got stuff spinning around it we want to treat this like a fluid again. Um, so uh, if I have uh, if I have a magnetic field and I have a bunch of electrons spinning around it and I ping another electron off of this guy, say I've got another electric field going this way and it's going to collide with this guy. It, they're going to change directions because they're going to run into each other, right? You know, maybe they'll jump onto other field lines. Maybe they'll go someplace else. So if that collision, if the collision frequency between electrons happens fast, then any given electron is going to be kind of on whatever magnetic field line it might happen to be, it might get on, it might get scattered around. So things can get scattered around uh, if the collision frequency is fast. If the collision frequency is really low, then all of my electrons are just going to all order along the local magnetic field, and you'll just have all of your electrons spinning around the magnetic field. And then it's not isotropic anymore. Does that make sense? That's the important bit. It's not isotropic anymore because I'll have all of my electrons lined up along this magnetic field and they're all doing the same thing in the same direction. So, so for isotropy, you want the collision frequency, which we talk about here, to be higher than the cyclotron frequency. That means you're mixing stuff up pretty fast. Um, so yeah, that was question one. Does anybody have any other questions about that answer to that question? Um, uh, and I think it might have been Joseph's question, and I'll ask that again when I get back. Uh, oh, and he had another question that I didn't understand. Uh, let's see, low beta plasma. Some of you had asked me about the effects of low beta plasma. So, uh, okay, beta, I haven't defined this in class yet, but beta is P gas over P magnetic. It's the gas pressure, so this is the pressure of the atoms smashing onto each other, divided by the magnetic pressure, which I haven't really quite talked too much about, but this is just the magnetic field, the total magnetic field strength. So I have these two pressures in my system, and if beta is high, then the magnetic field strength is low. And that's like most things, like air, or one of those plasma globes where you don't really see the imprint of the magnetic field in um, in those things. Um, a high plasma beta is like uh, the corona of the sun, where the magnetic field, especially where the magnetic field is coming out, right, right near the surface, the magnetic field is very strong. But what does the sun do? The sun does this incredibly crazy thing where this 
is 6,000 Kelvin. So this is the sun. It is 6,000 Kelvin. Here is the solar corona. It's the gas. It's the atmosphere around the sun. What is the temperature of the solar corona if the surface is 6,000 Kelvin? And it's the star nearby, so it's really the light source. What do you think the temperature of the corona is going to be? And if you happen to know, you can just yell. Rather high, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a million degrees. It's like a million degrees. It's like a thousand times larger than this thing that it's sitting on. It's weird. Why? Well, we made the fastest thing we've ever made and shot it at the sun to go try to figure this thing out. Um, turns out the answer is probably magnetic reconnection, but we get these magnetic fields. So, so this is very hot, but the density goes down to almost zero. So the pressure out here isn't very high. The pressure in the sun is pretty high, but the pressure in the, in the corona isn't very high. But we have these very large magnetic fields, uh, and they make these huge loops. And I'll show you some. Actually, I'll show you one right now. I got all my pictures up. Uh, I thought I had some. OK, I'm going to show you this. Here are sunspots. I'll talk more about sunspots in a minute. Um, oh, these are all sunspots. Um, OK, let's watch this movie. I'm going to put this on for a second, and I'm just going to kind of ramble about it. It's actually, this is an awesome video. Um, oh, I should have put on, I should have turned on. I got to do it this janky way. Uh, did it say just there what? Satellite, what telescope this was? I think it was, I think it was DSO. Um, oh, I want you quiet because it just has this noise. How do I? Where is the volume? There you go. Because I don't need that noise. But check this doesn't sound right. What the hell is that? The sun is about this big, so. What are these big stripes of gas? You can see that there's something here that's constraining the gas to fall on these big stripes. And there's more up here. Some of these are really cool. Oh, that, that one I love. Uh, I, have, I have favorite solar prominences. That's what that says something about me. Um, so watch right here. The gas shoots up and then it comes right back down, uh, unless I overshot it. I overshot it a little bit. Oh, here it starts. This thing did it again. You can see this gas is just like hanging above. There you go. It shoots up and then it falls right back down like a like rolling a ball up a hill and having it come back down. That's low beta plasma. So this is a very, very strong magnetic field and gas that really doesn't have any say in the matter about what's going on. Um, uh, what else do we see? So those are some of the coolest things. The bits over here are really the coolest things. Um, uh, what else did I want to say? I'm just going to let this play while I talk about the rest of this stuff. This is actually upside down for what that's worth. Um, not that anybody can really tell. Um, uh, but the Earth, the sun rotates the other direction. This one is slowly rotating that way. Um, uh, but you can see all of these, especially this sunspot here, is just bonkers because there's so much cool stuff. So what's going on in here? So we've got low blade of beta plasma that's constraining the motions of the gas. Um, uh, and we've got these eruptions, which come from reconnection. What is reconnection? Reconnection is when you take a rubber band and you twist it so hard it explodes. Except instead of rubber band, you use a magnetic field. And instead of, a, instead of breaking in half, it breaks and then connects back onto itself. Because a magnetic field has zero divergence, so there's no free ends to a magnetic field. So if you break a magnetic field, it has to reconnect to more magnetic fields somewhere else. And that process is very violent. I'll show you more about reconnection when we get there, um, but this is a lot of the. This is a great laboratory for a lot of the physics that we're going to talk about. Um, so this is like a ten-minute-long movie. So I'm just going to let it play while I while I talk about more stuff. Um, uh, one of you just said J cross B in the in your questions. Um, yeah, you covered it last time. Are you good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I wasn't sure what that meant, and so I figured I would just ask or or I would get there. Um, uh, oh, how often is the kink instability realized? All the time. This is just a problem. 
in when you make a tokamak. If you've got a strong magnetic field and a helical one, if you twist it, it's just going to explode. I'll show you that later. Um, uh, let's see. And do you think that there will be stable fusion this century? I hope so. Um, hopefully within my lifetime. That, that's maybe a stretch goal. There's this amazing plot. Let me see if I can find it. Did I have it here? Um, I thought it was right here. Oh, no, it's here. No, it's not here. Where is my... Anyway, there's a, a plot of, of fusion funding and fusion success versus research dollars. Uh, and, we're, and the projection was if you spent enough money, we could have stable fusion by about 2020. But we dumped in about 1% of, of what enough money is. So it's a very difficult problem, as, we, as we'll, we'll get to throughout the, throughout the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, okay, why are uh, the Debye length and the plasma frequency in indicators that charge separation is negligible? And I appreciate the way you wrote that question because that's, that's, the, that's the neat, is uh, charge separation you can ignore uh, whenever, uh, oops, I heard that. So if you're, so what does the Debye length say? So the Debye length says if I put a positive charge in a sea of negative charges, the charges kind of rearrange themselves so that I'll have my plus charge here and a bunch of negative charges over here. So that over here, if I look at this size, if I look at something that's this big and I average, that's by volume integral, um, I average over this region of space, I get zero charge. So if I average over the Debye length, okay, not quite, but if I average over the Debye length, I get a lot less charge than uh, than if I just look at the charges uh, themselves because the electrons move to screen out this. And bigger than that, there's no effective charge. Smaller than that, if I look at it really closely, I can see that there's a proton there. If I'm averaging over little sizes, there's a proton there. But if I'm looking at large enough regions, there's no actual proton. It's just like if I could zoom in all the way down into my hand, down to an electron, I can see one electron, and I can feel the charge of that. But there's a proton right next to it. So as soon as I get very far away, those charges cancel out. And I just see that. That's for when they're bound together. When the electron and the proton are tied to each other, then you've got a neutral atom. It's only, it only looks charged if you happen to be an electron. But if I have a bunch of free ones, it only looks charged if I happen to be bigger than the size where they're kind of averaging, averaging each other out. So that's the spatial part. The time scale comes from the cyclotron and plasma frequency. So these are the frequencies that the electrons uh, recombine or uh, adjust themselves with. So if I do something like make an electric field or make a magnetic field, it takes some time scale for the electrons to move. And as soon as they do, they cancel out any electric field that, uh, that would have been there. That's one of the things that electrons do. Um, so if I'm looking at processes that are of the same time scale as cyclotron and plasma frequency, and these are typically radio waves, then I can see the effect of the plasma. So if I have a radio wave traveling through a plasma, it'll rotate. I'll show you that. Um, but weird things happen when you have time scales that are on the order of the response time. But if it's slow, like, uh, like this process here, this takes days. Like these, this is a uh, this is a two-week movie that they crammed down to 10 minutes. Um, I want to say two weeks. I could sort it out if I was actually watching. The sun rotates every 11 days. Um, so however far around that thing has gotten. Um, so, but this is slow. The cyclotron frequency and the plasma frequencies are all really fast, so I can ignore the electric field of the sun. Now, if you happen to put yourself in a place where random people like to ask you about the sun, Sometimes you're going to get some crazies who talk about the electric field of the sun being the dominant physics. This is called the cold universe theory. It's utter nonsense, but you will hear about it from time to time. Um, uh, anyway, so because the cyclotron frequency is fast compared to, say, one of these things flowing, 
we can ignore the electric field from the whole flow and that so that that jet of stuff will come up that magnetic field and go back down the only thing that it's experiencing is the magnetic field the electric field it doesn't care about because the process is slow uh, does that make sense um, let's see um, yeah, the magnetic Reynolds number. I'll talk about the magnetic Reynolds number again. And are there other liquids liquids that that are affected by MHD processes? Um, have you guys ever seen ferrofluid? Um, so ferrofluid is this nasty black tarry stuff that responds to magnetic fields. Uh, I'd pull some up if I if there's internet down here. But it's really kind of awesome. It is. You can make it with basically cooking oil and uh, and spent toner because um, toner will make a little charged particles. Um, uh, so it's this material that you put it in a magnetic field and it'll move along the magnetic field. So that obeys the very viscous slow MHD uh, equations. Um, uh, also, if you, if you liquefy gallium or, or sodium, both of those you can liquefy at relatively low temperatures and you can charge they they will become a plasma of sorts because they're very they're very good conductors so if you liquefy sodium you can make a liquid dynamo that creates magnetic fields by just stirring up the liquid the problem with liquid sodium i don't know if you've ever seen sodium that interact with water sodium is largely explosive so if you need something remember our magnetic reynolds number proportional to the length so i need a lot of it so they get pretty explosive. There's all, I think there's only two liquid sodium dynamos. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, there are liquid ap applications uh, as well. So there are many applications of the MHD equations to other liquids uh, and fluids, uh, not just plasmas. Uh, I think that's it. Does anybody have any other questions that they wanted to ask about the reading before I move on? Anything else that's burning in your mind? If not, we'll move on. So let's talk about the equations. I'm not going to derive them again. I'll, I'll show you where the der derivation comes from. I mean, I'm going to hint at it, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, so OK, what am I talking about? Oh, I wrote this big note. This is vote. Today's voting day. You remember how I was talking about fusion funding? There are teams that care about fusion funding and teams that don't care about fusion funding. They really frown on me getting too political up here. But you should go vote. I don't care who you vote for, just vote. Uh, uh, make a plan, take a buddy, make a party of it, get real drunk, go vote. No, <laughs> vote sober. <laughs> vote out, party afterwards. Um, okay, so MHD equations. Uh, where can I write them so that I'll leave them alone? Uh, I'll write them on this board and then I won't touch them. I think I'll, that's probably a lie. Um, okay. dB dt plus v dot grad v. Remember how we threw this term around and so we got the turbulence, in which case we didn't really touch the term. We talked about other crazy nonsense. We're going to mostly throw this one out when we're talking about MHD. Until we get to the mean field dynamo but I don't think we're gonna get there because I don't think we have enough time. I've only gotten to mean field dynamo once uh, in teaching this class. Uh, I happen to go really, really fast through everything. Um, uh, but it's the last thing in the book and it's very cool. Um, so we're probably gonna throw this out because MHD turbulence is really confusing and also really poorly studied. Um, okay, so dv dt plus v dot grad v is minus one over rho grad p plus 1 over 4 pi rho del cross b cross b oops, I don't want that plus nu del squared v but we're going to ignore that term too for everything that we do, but it's there um, this is velocity, so this is the Lorentz force we'll talk about this in detail in a second um, but it comes from basically uh, F equals, going all the way back to the first thing that you remember about, about E and M, 
F equals Q E plus B over C cross B. So this is where everything comes from. This is when we use this in a couple of different places in the derivation. Um, but we ignore the electric field and we're just left with QV. Q times V is the current. Um, so this just becomes J cross B. And J is curl of B from Maxwell's equations. You don't have to remember any of that, but that's where it all comes from. And our induction equation, where the magnetic field comes from, now that we've got this new variable, we need a new constituent equation to derive it. D by dt of B equals, OK, del cross V cross B. OK, I always have the worst time with remembering what goes in front, because in Maxwell's equation, there's a minus 1 over C, and there's an E here. But if we use a thing I just erased and get an E and cram it in here, then the 1 over C goes away. So there's nothing in front of this curl. Curl of V cross B plus lambda del square B. Now, let's talk about the first one for a second. I'm, I'm going to leave those alone. Shove these over here. Start writing the other sides. See you again when we get there. Um, where the hell was I? Oh, yeah, okay. Del cross B cross B is not a very useful or intuitive mathematical expression because it's the curl of a thing cross itself, and I don't have a lot of good intuition for that. Um, but Sometimes that's the way you need to think about it. Now we can spit out one of our favorite vector identities, and we can rewrite this as uh, uh, b dot grad b minus grad of b squared over 2. That's just using a vector identity on this thing to bust out this. And this gives us two objects that are a lot more intuitive. So let's talk about the slightly more intuitive one, minus b squared over 2. So if I plug this back into the equation over here, I'm left with the right-hand side looks like minus 1 over rho grad p minus 1 over 4 pi rho grad b squared over 2, plus another term that I'll talk about in a second. I got 1 over, gra one over rho grad of a scalar. I'll just do a little bit of algebra and we'll write this as 1 over rho grad p plus b squared over 8 pi. This is a scalar, right? I can just pack these things together mathematically. This is your math stunt. They look exactly the same mathematically. They're both scalars. I'm taking the gradient with this 1 over rho. This is the magnetic pressure, B squared. So what is magnetic pressure? If you got some magnetic field, it by itself has some pressure. And it will contribute to the motion of gas just by being a magnetic field. Now. You can make connections back to Maxwell's equations and J cross B, because that's where this came from. But it's probably better to start thinking about the magnetic field as a thing like rebar in a fluid. If you guys ever uh, demolished a house or a road or been involved in large scale construction, are you familiar with what rebar is? So OK, rebar is when you have a you have a concrete. Concrete is not strong if you twist it, right? It falls apart. It breaks. But if you put steel rods in it, it will not break anymore. Um, similarly, if you crush it, it's pretty good under crushing. Um, uh, magnetic fields work like rebar. They provide attention, and they provide support to the fluid. One of the aspects is in this pressure. So just by being there, it supplies pressure. 
The other term is b dot grad b. So what is this? Um, it is a tension. And how do we see that it's a tension? So first off, what does b dot grad b mean? b dot grad means I'm taking the derivative along the field, because I'm dotting the grad in with the vector. And then I'm taking the derivative along the field of the field. So this is, if I've got something like this, I'm going along this way, and I'm asking how far this way I went. It's just the curvature. It's just a, it's just a measurement of the curvature of the field. Now, if you're going to turn it into an actual curvature, you've got to make it dimensionless. So it's like b squared times the actual curvature itself. Um, Magnetic fields want to be straight. They want to go in a straight line, and they're going to tend to straighten themselves out. That's what this says. And they're going to take the fluid with them. So like rebar, they provide rigidity to the fluid that they're in. Uh, unless sometimes they cause things to explode, because they can do that too. So it's not a stabilizing effect. It's usually a destabilizing effect, unless you do it right, in which case it's a stabilizing effect messy business. So that's these two terms. So magnetic fields give us a pressure and a tension in the structure, in the structures that we're dealing with. Does that make sense? So um, yeah. Oh, sorry, this is everything. So in the last term, let's talk about the induction equation for a second. So induction is del cross B cross B. Again, you got to make sure that you put the parentheses in the right spot. Because I have del cross B cross B. And that one is the curl first. This one is the curl with the cross product. Um, plus lambda del b squared. Not? Uh, nope. Del squared b, which is different from del b squared. We have, del, we have grad b squared. That's the pressure, which does something way different than grad squared b. That's the diffusivity. So this bit pushes stuff around, just like in the Navier-Stokes equation. This diffuses the magnetic field past the stuff. So this is how the magnetic field is dissipated. This is where non-ideal effects come from. So this is resistivity. So now one thing you can do is say, uh, so when you want to make an energy equation, you have d by dt of v dot v into that, and then you have something for v squared. Sometimes you might need a row. Then you got to do a little bit more work, but not a lot. But you basically take dv dt and you dot v into it. And that gives you the evolution of v squared, or the total energy. Similarly, if I take this equation and I dot v into it, so I take v and I dot it into this, you get some gnarly equation that I haven't decided if I'm going to aside from my homework or not. Um, there's another homework on MHD stuff coming, and it hasn't been written yet. Uh, right now it's really easy because I've got a grant due, and that's the only thing that I can think about. As soon as that's done, then I'm going to write our super hard yeah, uh, MHD homework. Um, so if you take B and you dot it into this, and then you jump through a whole bunch of vector identities, you're left with a thing that goes like J squared times 1 over sigma. So it turns into db dt plus the divergence of some stuff equals j squared. There's some 4 pi's and stuff, so I'm waving my hands a little bit. So j squared is the thing that's not in the grad. This is making a conservation law, just like we did before. Oh, b squared. So j squared is the dissipation. How do you remember that? Because what do you remember about power from, how many of you have taken some circuits at all? Have you guys seen circuits anywhere? Like Ohm's Law? 
Yeah. Uh, there's a couple different ways to write it. Um, the one that I like is I squared R. P also equals I B. Um, and B equals I R, that turns into an I squared. This is the same, this is the same statement. That the dissipation rate is, oh, that's one over sigma. Let's turn that into a resistivity. Now it's a resistivity. This is a resistivity times a current squared. It's the same thing. This is a current squared times a resistivity. We don't really need to deal with dissipation too much right now, but it happens. So we can define a magnetic Reynolds number, which we'll just go through the same dimensional analysis uh, with this equation that we did with Navier-Stokes, and we define the magnetic Reynolds number as the length scale times the velocity over the magnetic diffusivity. And we can define, and what this does is it talks about the relative importance of this term versus this term. So it's the relative importance of the bit that is going to amplify the magnetic field versus the bit that's just going to destroy the magnetic field. So we have this kind of uh, uh, two level, or two pieces of physics. We have uh, this first term, and this will amplify the magnetic field. And I can show you why. Um, there's a similar vector identity, so you know how to pull the vector identity with j cross b to make something that's more intuitive. If you expand this in vector identities, you get something that's also more intuitive. Um, uh, but I didn't write it down. I can. So if you expand this bit, um, uh, this turns into minus b dot grad b plus b dot grad b plus div b, uh, no, minus div b times b. Wait, what term this. is that? Okay. So this curl of b cross b turns into these three terms. It's a simple vector identity. The vector identity just says that this turns into this. It's, it's simple. Um, and this we can see as a convective part the stretching of the magnetic field, b dot v, b dot grad v, because this is the velocity changes along the field, and if those are positive, they're going to stretch the magnetic field. Stretching the magnetic field makes it stronger, which is kind of awesome. And then div v times b, div v is squishing, so if you take some field and you squish it, the field gets stronger. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I think I might assign this as a homework assignment uh, because this is a useful exercise for us to think about what each one of these terms means. So this is how you amplify magnetic field. So how do you amplify magnetic field? You can push it around, you can stretch it, or you can squish it. So this term can amplify the magnetic field, but this one can't. This one only diffuses. Um, so we have this knob, the magnetic Reynolds number which it gives me the, the, the length and the velocities of my system divided by the diffusivity. And the book goes through a nice cute argument where they say, okay, for 10, for a plasma that's 10 to the 4 Kelvin, um, uh, that gives you a log lambda of like 10, probably like 10, maybe it's 12. Um, this gives you a magnetic diffusivity of 10 to the 7 centimeters squared per second. Um, so you can plug this into your Reynolds number. And if, the, if we have a length of 100 centimeters and a velocity of 10 centimeters per second, then this gives us a value of what, 10 to the minus 4 for the magnetic Reynolds number? And what that says is if this is 10 to the minus 4, then this term is going to dominate. So very small numbers means the second one's going to dominate. Very large numbers means the first one. So if I have a small object, 100 centimeters, how big is 100 centimeters? Uh, like yay, right? Like three feet? That's about how big you can build an object where you're going to contain 10,000 Kelvin plasma. Your velocity is at 10, then that gives you a value of like 10 to the minus 4, so you have to ignore, you can ignore this term in terms of this one. But if I have L is... 10 to the 18 centimeters, and the velocity is, say, 
uh, 10 kilometers per second, which is a much more astrophysical value of a velocity, um, then you get a number of like 10 to the 6, uh, a Reynolds number of like 10 to the 6. And um, oh, he'd used a 10 to the 8 centimeters. So, um, and then this term dominates over this term. So it depends on the system, and I'll always specify uh, what the enough parameters. Um, okay, so that is the induction equation. We'll talk more about it, but does anybody have any questions about these tidbits? Pretty good. Um, okay, one of the upshots of the induction equation is that it looks exactly like the vorticity equation, and we already have a really nice statement for the vorticity equation. If we can ignore this term, this term jacks everything up. But if we get to ignore that term, which in astrophysics we get to most of the time, like if you happen to be on the sun or if you happen to be in a galaxy cluster and you're talking about the plasma inside of a galaxy cluster, um, then we just have this, this term. And one thing I showed at the beginning of the semester, and the proof is kind of um, awkward, so I'm not going to go through it again, unless anybody's like really super stoked. I'm just not going to do it now. Um, we have that d by dt of the integral of b dot dA over some surface is 0. So this is kind of innocuous looking equation for something that has as much power as it does. What this says is that if I have some magnetic field lines, and I take some perpendicular surface across them, the fluid is pinned to the magnetic field lines. So that means if I take a magnetic field line and I move it, I move all the fluid with it too. That means if I have a magnetic field that's kind of set up there because of some other source, and I have an explosion, all that fluid is just going to follow the magnetic field lines, just like it did in the sun. So on those limb of the on the limb of the sun, you saw those explosions where the gas went up on an arc and came back down because it's pinned like it's on rails to ride along that magnetic field. That's really the biggest uh, the biggest upshot is it pins the magnetic fields to the fluid, so the two are in inextricably uh, linked together. Now also if I have a magnetic field in a flow here, and another magnetic field in another flow here, and I push them together really goddamn hard, then I'll get a situation where I have a magnetic field like this and a magnetic field like this right next to each other. And if I do it hard enough, then these magnetic fields cancel each other out. And then I have all that magnetic energy that's got to go somewhere and it turns into heat and kinetic energy. We'll talk about reconnection here in a minute. So, but this is another, another upshot of Alvain's theorem. This is called Alvain's theorem. After Hans Alvain, who developed most of this uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, and won the Nobel Prize for MHD in 78 or something. Um, uh, so Alvain's theorem says that the fluid and the magnetic field are inherently tied together. And if I move one, I'm going to move the other. Um, unless there's diffusivity, in which case you can take care of it. You can figure out how fast does the magnetic field. If I move a fluid, how fast does the magnetic field slip out? Because it will. But that's uh, for a different talk. Um, so that's what the second term will do, is, is, is breaks Alvain's theorem. Uh, does anybody have any questions about Alvain's theorem? Pretty good. Um, so, let's talk about one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that anybody cares about this stuff, one of the big funding things in this is fusion. So let's talk about fusion. So, just for a minute, and this is going to be maybe not a satisfactory update of everything that's going on in fusion because since the book was written, this book is from 1995, which is, I think, older than a lot of you, right? Um, so there's noticeably a lot of things that are missing from the book. Um, I graduated high school in 1995. That was a really long time ago, right? 
uh, there's been a lot of physics that's happened in the last 30 some odd years. So um, we'll go through, a, I'm going to give you a really nickel tour of current fusion devices and, and how it works. So, okay, so the simplest, and I think the first ever magnetic confinement device, it's called a magnetic mirror. So if you have a magnetic field like this, where the magnetic field lines, this is B, where the magnetic field lines come to a point, uh, it turns out that if I have an electron that's spiraling, spiraling around, actually an ion, because we want to use, um, uh, well, just this back up to the top. What is fusion? Proton plus proton equals helium. Uh, that's actually energetically really difficult. So, so what they do instead is they have a deuteron, which is a proton and a neutron, and they smack it into another deuteron and they make a helium four. Or they use tritium because that turns out that's even easier, but tritium is toxic, so that's a little problematic and rare, but not super rare. Um, so basically, the idea is we want to take two <coughs> uh, two deuterium atoms and smash them together to form a helium. So what is how does that work? What does what does the binding potential of the deuterium look like? So this is zero energy, and this is R out this direction. The binding energy is a very low bit followed by a very high bit, and then this one over R squared kind of fall off. So this is what the potential energy looks like for a nucleus. I've got this Coulomb barrier that goes like one over R squared from the Coulomb force. But then when I'm inside that, I have a very strongly attracting potential that's from the strong force. So we have the strong force here, and the electric force here. So what I need to do is smash enough things together for long enough so that a bunch of them stick together. So if I just send another deuterium at this, if I don't hit it hard enough, then it won't, then it'll just bounce off the barrier. But if I hit it hard enough, then it will tunnel quantum mechanically. It doesn't go over the barrier, it goes through the barrier. It tunnels through the barrier into the center of the nucleus. So that's the goal. And so what I need what I need is a lot of density and I need a lot of time. And the product of density and time have to be bigger than what is it? 10 to the 16 seconds per centimeter. Um, so this is a lot of collisions per second per um, uh, so this is either, so 10 to the, six, let's think about this for a second. 10 to the 16 is time times uh, density. If time is 1 and the density is 10 to the 16, that's denser than the nucleus of an atom. So the density of the nucleus is like 10 to the 14. If time is 10 to the 16 seconds and the density is 1, that's actually a pretty low density, but... If the density is 1 and the time, actually, no, a density of 1 is a reasonable density. But we have a time of 10 to the 16 seconds. How long is 10 to the 16 seconds? How long is a year in seconds? Do you know? Is it like 10 to the 9? It's pi times 10 to the 7 seconds. It's like 3.14 times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. So this is a really long time. So we got to have a bunch of density, and it's going to have to be there for a while for you to be able to fuse. So we have to have a stable plasma, and it has to be pretty dense. So how do we go about doing that? So what are the current, what's the current technology look like? So if I have a, if I have, I can make a magnetic bottle like this. So if I have a charged, uh, if I have a deuteron that's spinning around my magnetic field here, it seems a pretty small, it has a pretty low magnetic field here, and so the cyclotron frequency is pretty high, uh, it's pretty low. Uh, if I send it this way, as it moves towards the end, the cyclotron frequency goes up because the field strength goes up, and if you do it right, it will bounce off. So I can make a magnetic, so if I can make a magnetic bottle, 
where I just bounce my, my deuterons from side to side. And that's pretty cool, except for the fact that they leak out, and this is not stable. So we'll talk about the stability of this in a second. This isn't a stable configuration, but it's kind of the simplest thing that you can define. The next simplest thing you can define is just a solenoid. So if I just have a coil of wire, and I've a current in this wire, and I have a magnetic field like this, then I can have my particles drift around the magnetic field. But this has to be infinitely long for this to make sense. And this would be really cool um, if we could make it make sense, because you can make a straight thing a lot more stable than you can make a curved thing. But you can't make a straight thing infinitely long. That's problematic. So you bend it. Now this is a top-down view. These are the curves of my solenoid. So now my solenoid looks like this. So it's like a it's like a slinky when you touch the ends together, right? Now my current goes in here, but now I've got more field in here than out here, and particles actually uh, wind up drifting outwards because I, they get this really short cyclotron radius in here and a really long cyclotron radius out here, so they just drift outwards, and it doesn't work either. So what you need to make is a tokamak. A tokamak is like this ring um, uh, solenoid, except you drive a guide current through the center, and you do a lot more with the geometry of the, of the torus. So a tokamak is basically a torus of magnetic field, and the plasma stays inside the torus. So one of these looks like this. Um, so eater is the next generation of fusion experiments, and it's currently being built in France. Um, it's pretty exciting because this is one of those uh, physics experiments that I've been hearing about since I started doing physics way long time ago. Um, but it, now it's getting built. It's actually there's broken ground. There's a building. Um, I don't I don't do a good job of following either. But this is what the building looks like. And let's see, um, a person is about yay big. So this is a very large object. And in here is where um, uh, the plasma is. You have this D-shaped torus. And there's a plasma on the inside. There's a guide current on the inside that's driven by all of this other apparatus and machinery around it. Um, <coughs> this is our current like best hope. Um, uh, this is called EDER. which stands for things in French, and I'm not going to try. I can't, I can't make French sounds. Um, oh, actually, I'm, I'm up there still. Uh, so that's a tokamak. There's, there are several good tokamaks out there. Um, but there, but they haven't, there hasn't been one that's been successful. Now, there's another kind of thing that looks a lot like a tokamak, but is called a stellarator, which Gene, I, uh, I think Gene Parker invented. And it looks like this. That's not straight. So they finally have built one of these. It took, um, uh, these were developed, these were postulated in the 50s, but it took until about two years ago for one to actually successfully get turned on. So what is the difference? So it's still a kind of a Taurus, but there's a twist to it. And what the twist does is uh, magnetic or particles tend to drift away. So what this does is sometimes they're on the outside, but the twist brings them back on the inside. So if things tend to drift radially outwards, stuff gets brought back towards the in, towards the inner radius so that it'll so that it won't drift outwards. So it helps with the particles not leaving the field. This is called a stellarator. Uh, and there's a good one called Wusterland uh, W7X. Oh, that's actually this. Um, so this is the uh, uh, so these these things are the shapes of the magnetic coils that make the magnetic fields. And you see how bonkers the shape is. The shape has to be really weird to do what you want it to do. It took until modern computer aided design to really be able to fabricate 
this object, but let's see, do I think I have a picture of it? Nope, I just have that picture twice. Uh, let's see, uh, the other way to make fusion happen is the is like this. This is a capsule of, of frozen tritium. And this object is called NIF, which stands for the National Ignition Facility. And what it does is it takes 192 lasers that are about this big across, and it focuses them on this object. It's the biggest laser in the world. It looks like this. Uh, let's see. So, okay. This little capsule is called a capsule. This object here is called a hall realm, which is German for a hollow room. And the capsule lives in here, and this gets lit up by the, by, uh, by the lasers. And then the x-rays that are produced by this gold actually do the drive um, to collapse the object. The laser bay looks like this. How big can I make this? There you go, that doesn't work. So this is the laser bay. Um, this is, I don't know if you get a sense of how big this is, maybe is my image any better? I do it this way. No, that's not really any better, it's a little picture. There are two of these, and I don't know if you can see, like a person is about this big, a person's about yay big, so this is like a, couple, this is like a football field long. Um, and there's two of these, they're all lasers. Each one of these pipes, and there's a stack of a bunch of them. Each one of these pipes is a laser that's about yay big. Um, uh, this is in California. Um, uh, this, unfortunately, has been unsuccessful. Um, uh, they have broken ground and gotten fusion to happen recently. Over the summer, they finally did it. They were supposed to have it done in 2012, and that did not work. But they're getting there because it turns out it's very difficult to keep all the instability down. Um, so for this, for ITER, or for NIF, magnetic fields are really bad because a magnetic field gets in the way and stops things from getting crushed. And it turns out nature likes to screw with you, so it has a way of making magnetic fields out of nothing when you're really violent. So when in the scenario of the ultraviolence of NIF, it'll make tiny little magnetic fields that jack up the, um, the compression. Um, in, in W7X or NIF, uh, these are, oh, this is the building layout. This is awesome. Um, magnetic fields are crucial. Magnetic fields do it all. This is really what the machine looks like. So this is a 10-story building. Uh, and these, each one of these is a laser, and they all go through all of these pipes to this spherical room, and this spherical room is about 10 meters in diameter, and all of these lasers focus down into a point right at the center of the, um, uh, right in the center of that sphere. And it's really cool, it's a really cool device, it's really a bummer that it didn't work. Um, uh, this idea has been shown to work, but it requires nuclear explosions to do it, and that's hard and not really a thing we want to be doing for our energy sources. We want clean power. So uh, that's nine seconds on the state of fusion. Um, so fusion is a very exciting field to be, to be working in. I, it's one of those things that I would love to spend more time on. But um, I actually have a project on this machine, but not to do fusion, to do star formation um, that I'll tell you about at some other point in time. Um, mostly because I don't have any bots on this. I don't have any of the pictures on this uh, laptop. I don't think. I don't. Um, so that's a big part of why we want to do any of this. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about stability. How do you make a column of magnetic fields that you can trap stuff on? So, 
Let us say I've got a toroidal magnetic field. Uh, and we're in, let's say it's a cylinder. I, yeah, that kind of implies cylinder. So let's say we've got a, a cylinder of magnetic field that just wraps around like that. So one way one could make this is with a large current, um, or you could have Helmholtz coils. So there's several ways you could make such a magnetic field. Let's just presume that Jesus gave us one. So we have this magnetic field. We want to talk about what it does and its stability. So let's talk about how to make it. So the first thing we need to do is have a current. Actually, let's talk about math first. Actually, let's talk about the fundamental equations first. So we start with the MHD equation. And we say, I want to just make something that's stable and stays there. Not like, does anything interesting? We want the dumbest thing we can do, boring, doesn't do anything. So we set the velocity equal to zero. And we're left with zero equals minus one over rho grad p plus, uh, actually, I'm going to write this this way, p plus b squared over 8 pi minus b dot grad b over 4 pi. I like writing it this way better than the other way, even though the other way is more compact and closer to the derivation of the equation itself. This way is a lot more intuitive because I can see the pressure bit and I can see the tension bit. So this is just the MHD equation with the velocity thrown out. So this is what I want. Now, okay, I want the velocity to be zero. I want a hydrostatic system. BB dt equals curl V cross B, but if V is zero, then that term is zero. This is just lambda del squared uh, B. And it doesn't matter how small this is, it's always there. Um, so eventually the field will diffuse. This is different from hydrostatics where I can make a column of water that's a thousand feet high and it will have a pressure gradient that perfectly matches gravity and it will stay there forever. If I try to do something similar where I, ma where I match some magnetic pressure gradient with gravity, for instance, the magnetic field will eventually decay. So Calling it statics is really kind of BS, kind of staticish. But if we make the conductivity low enough, then the time scale that I have my magnetic field stable is pretty high. Now for a lot of this, I'm going to say that, it's that lambda equals zero, which makes it a perfect conductor. But that's different from a superconductor. So a superconductor has this extra property that it expels magnetic fields. A perfect conductor doesn't do that. It'll just be a good conductor and have magnetic fields in it. So the difference is they both have the conductivity going to infinity or the resistivity going to zero. Um, but one of them you can make in a lab and the other one is a math exercise. Um, so a superconductor you can really make. A perfect conductor, uh, big clouds of gas in outer space that come pretty close. The sun comes pretty close. Um, uh, okay, back to the point. Where are we? So we want a toroidal magnetic field like a tube. This is the simplest magnetic field that I can think of that I can actually make that's stable and compact and doesn't like spread off to infinity. So we'll define this. B equals some B theta of R theta hat plus B Z of R Z hat. So we've got some aroundness and some up this wayness. Now I'm actually we're not going to do anything with the up or this wayness. We're going to set it to zero, but I'll follow what the book does anyway. Um, so I can add a magnetic field going up this way, and that's uh, uh, often a good thing to do because it stabilizes things, as I'll show you. Um, so we drop this into here, and we want to say, okay, if I've got a magnetic field like this, what kind of pressure? Um, uh, 
is that going to give me? And what kind of uh, current do I need to make such a magnetic field? Let's do a little bit of math first. So uh, first, let's plug this into here. And we're left with 0 equals, OK. Uh, ooh. Ooh, I missed a row on that one, too. Huh. I can multiply through by row, get rid of row. And I got uh, grad p plus b theta squared plus b z squared over 8 pi. That's this bit. Minus b dot grad b. OK, what's b dot grad b here? Well, we got to work it out because theta and z, theta hat, z hat both depend on theta and z. So let's do a little bit of math. The one thing that I remember is d theta hat d theta equals minus r hat over r. The thing I wrote down on the side of my paper before I got started. I don't know. There's There are ways you can think about remembering this because think about there's r and there's theta. Theta, if I go in this direction, it's going to change in that direction. So, um, so if I remember this and work this out here, then this simplifies to 0 equals grad p uh, plus b theta squared over 8 pi mi uh, minus b theta squared over 4 pi r. Oh, and that's the Because there's a minus sign that comes from somewhere else. Oh, there's a minus sign here from here. So this term doesn't come from the gradient. It comes from the derivative of the unit vector. But that's OK. All right, so that tells us how the pressure and the magnetic field are related. Let's say that I have some current, J, that is supporting my magnetic field. So Maxwell tells us that curl of B equals 4 pi over C, J. That's one of Maxwell's equations. Actually, Maxwell's equations also has a dE dt on there, but we got rid of E. So we're just left with J. So curl of B in cylindrical coordinates is 1 over R, D by dr, R, B, theta. That's the only term in the curl that survives. You can check that if you like. Um, uh, this equals 4 pi over C j. Let's say that j is uniform, which is fine if I'm looking at a small enough region of space, um, but terrible if I'm looking at everywhere. But let's go with it for now. So let's say j is uniform. Then I can integrate this. And I just multiply by r, integrate, divide by r, and then I'm done. And I'm left with b theta. Uh, let's see. Equals 2 pi over c times j, which is a constant, times r. All right. Let's shove that over here. I need all that stuff. You should see my desk, it just piles of paper everywhere. As I change tasks. Okay. So, what is P? So, that was not an exception to worry. So, the B is the B theta equals 2 pi over C j times r. The r is the only important bit in this. j is a constant. That's just you know how much current I'm dumping into this scenario. So then I get d by dr of p plus b theta squared over 8 pi. Let's set bz to 0 for now. Plus b squared theta over 4 pi r equals 0. Let me just take this and plug it into here and integrate twice. And 
not worth me doing that. And I'm left with P uh, equals my central pressure uh, minus pi over C squared J squared R squared. So what this looks like, here's my universe right now. My current is constant. My magnetic field just gets bigger with R. And my pressure falls off like a parabola. Now this is awesome because I can't have negative pressure. So that goes to zero and then stops. No more stuff there. So all my stuff is confined to the inside. Is so that's cool. Was that is it supposed to like align perfectly at one point? Oh no, it's not supposed to cross necessarily. Okay. Um, uh, that's a fluke of my drawing. Um, uh, the important bit is it goes through zero. So that means there's a place where all the stuff is contained inside. Nothing's leaving this bottle. There's zero pressure out here. Nobody wants to go out there. There's no stuff there. And I've supported. There's pressure gradient, which is going to push things out, but there's a magnetic gradient, which totally balances that. That's what this sentence tells us. The, the pressure gradients balance out. So the pressure gradient comes from two pieces. It comes from the B squared piece, which is a pressure. So the magnetic field in this gas is pushing out. That's what this part tells you. But it's also pulling in. That's what this part is telling you. This is called the hoop stress. This, car, this part, remember, came from the B dot grad B term. This is the curvature term. So the fact that my magnetic field is round means that there's a force trying to straighten it out. So that's pulling in this way. This is called the hoop stress. Because I've got a round thing. It wants to pull in. It doesn't want to get pulled out. This is like. Uh, so this is how you can. This is the basic of how you can find a uh, uh, how you can find a plasma. Now, clearly, uniform current everywhere in all space is not realistic, and this is infinitely infinitely long in z. Um, uh, let's see. You can do this again with a magnetic field with a current that does not depend on space, but I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to talk about the stability of this. So, uh, and it's in the book, and I think that you read it. Uh, and if I really care, I'll make a homework assignment on it. Um, let's talk about the stability of such a such a column. So okay, if I take a column like this and I bend it, that's the easiest thing to do. I mean, it's the easiest thing to mathematically do. Um, I have all of these parallel hoops of magnetic field. And if I twist it, then I have a lot more magnetic field over here. Now, that's more magnetic field relative to this side. So the hoop stress, the B theta squared over R term, gets a lot bigger here. And the B theta squared over R term is pushing in this direction. So as I increase this, the amount of force that's pushing towards the axis increases, and this thing blows out the side. So it explodes from this stress pushing it out that way. So I can't do this. This doesn't work. The first instability is called the kink instability. So as soon as you bend it, all hell breaks loose. And it's really a, it's really, uh, a huge problem, because as soon as this gets a little closer, you get an, un you get an unbalanced uh, scenario. Um, and it's runaway. I. Uh, I have never sat down to actually work out this stability. 
um, one can do it just like we did stability for interface instabilities uh, or genes instability. One can do a similar stability analysis, but we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. The other, the other uh, instability that they talk about in the book is the kink instability, and that's what happens if you squeeze it a little bit. Keeping the field strength the same, if I squeeze it a little bit, it'll squeeze off more. Because I squeeze it a little bit, the curvature goes up, the field strength goes up. Be remember Alphane's theorem. If I squeeze it, I push that magnetic field with whatever I'm, with the fluid. So the magnetic field gets dragged in. So all of the magnetic field just gets stronger there. And once it gets stronger there, it's a, that part of the squeezing term, that squeezing pinches off and pinches off the rest of the, the bit. You can see the sausage instability in the bathroom. If you turn on the tap water, dirty people, turn on the tap and watch, uh, watch the water come out of the faucet. Have you ever done this? Certainly, you've made dinner before. You have a faucet, water comes out, and it kind of does that, right? The water goes, if you ever stare at a faucet really close, it, it gets pinchier, and then it gets pinchier and pinchier and pinchier until, until you get beads of drops. So it, it pinches off. It's the same sausage instability. It's also called the sausage instability um, because it's the same thing. This is a tension. So this magnetic tension goes up. You squeeze it. The tension goes up. The squeezing gets more. The same thing happens with water drops. The surface tension is what's doing this squeezing. Um, as the surface tension goes up, it pinches off, and then you get drops of water, and then they become round, and then they fall down into the basin. Um, uh, so, unfortunately, this, this scenario is not stable. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. If you add a strong magnetic field, that is going to also have some tension. So if I bend, the BZ will have some tension and want to straighten things back out. So there's the hope that if I add a guide field that I can prevent kink instability. It does not work very well, unfortunately. Um, similarly, I think it prevents the sausage instability to have a guide, uh, a guide field like that. Um, so there are ways around it, but this is the mains, the mains of the problem. Um, and then I'm done talking. So that's all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions about any of those things? Yeah. Oh, right. I totally forgot about office hours. Um, does anybody need, when, when do you care? Tomorrow. Tomorrow's fine for you. Does anybody Tomorrow want to, Tomorrow's good for you. Does anybody want to come today? Uh, if any, what's that? That's all right. If, if you want to, if you want to show up today, just show up. Um, so I'll be, I'll be in my office at, at, at four if you guys want to. So I'll have office hours today if you want to. Um, but then I'll, also, I will definitely also do it tomorrow. Yeah. And I appreciate him reminding me because I had forgotten. <laughs> Uh...